Hi there, and very welcome to this IBFD webinar, Managing Tax Disputes in Europe. My name is Tomasz Kuczar. I'm the manager of international tax training at IBFD Amsterdam. Uh, here with me today uh, for today's webinar, Hans uh, Moy and Jasna Voya. Hans and Jasna, very welcome. Thank you very much for joining us. A few words about you. Yes, well, um, I'm currently an independent tax consultant, uh, but I have a very long experience as competent authority for the Dutch government um, dealing with um, tax disputes, uh, knowing how to do it and how not to do it. Um, some five years ago, out of frustration of the poor state of dispute resolution internationally, I started out a tribute initiative uh, together with a couple of friends of mine, which now let's say a really large global network. And actually one of the very first projects we took on was to try and persuade the European Commission in coming up with a directive. All right. So, I mean, I feel quite Respons satisfied, <laughs> to be honest, now that it's there. Right, I thought we will hold you personally responsible. But <laughs> oh, we'll yes. Thank you very much for coming, Hans. Uh, Jasna, a few words about yourself. Thank you. Well, I guess that's where I come in, because where the first time I got more concretely involved in tax disputes was at the drafting and the negotiation of the directive European Commission, where we went through the council meetings, uh, redrafting from the first proposal to the adoption. And after that, um, I also stayed closely connected with the topic uh, while I worked at the, one of the big fours. And currently, during my research at the University of Oxford, I'm focusing on the tax disputes and the taxpayers' rights. So the interplay between both and the practical implications. Well, thank you very much and uh, very welcome uh, again. A few useful tips and a little bit of explanation for those of you who join us for the first time. So this is an idea of the webinar, live webinar, live video stream from our Amsterdam studio. Um, we scheduled the webinar for one and a half hours, but the actual length will depend on the number of the questions we receive. So in case you would like to get in touch with Hans and uh, Jasna about today's uh, topics and the slides and you have any question, uh, that you would like to have uh, to be answered, we urge you to uh, connect us, uh, connect to us via the chat box, the chat functionality that is available on your monitor. In case you can't follow the webinar in its entirety, please do not worry. You have access to it via our tax research platform for 12 months. We are also going to roll out uh, and present uh, poor questions to engage, um, to interact with you, to ask your opinion about different aspects of today's uh, webinar. In case you would like to obtain a CPE credit from your professional uh, organization, local organization, please do answer those questions. At the end of the webinar, a marketing survey will also pop up on your screen. Uh, we are looking for your opinion, feedback about the webinar, the look and feel, the technicalities, uh, the content, the performance of the presenter. So we do value your opinion. So please bear with us and uh, fill in the survey. All right, without further ado, let me just uh, briefly explain uh, today's agenda. So as you can see, we're going to discuss uh, tax dispute resolution within Europe. This webinar is the third of a series of webinars dealing with uh, recent developments in European uh, corporate uh, taxation. The first one dealt with the European Anti-Tax Avoiders Directive. Uh, a few weeks ago, we discussed also the new mandatory disclosure rules. And today's topic is really uh, about tax dispute resolution in Europe. Uh, we are going to look at the ways and the means Essentially, at the beginning of the webinar, the, the choice is the alternatives available for taxpayers to resolve disputes, domestic, international. We brought you some statistics to discuss the practical aspects as well and the, perhaps the popularity of, uh, of the different alternatives. Then we are going to compare essentially these uh, different uh, tools, uh, merits, benefits, advantages of the different uh, aspects before we turn to the effective dates and implementation of the new uh, European uh, directive. And the core part of the webinar will be dedicated to the practical consideration regarding the, the uh, new directive. So we look at actually what are the different phases. We brought you different kind of scenarios, um, different alternatives. We look at the stages, taxpayers' obligations, rights, how you can manage this procedure, what it means in practice uh, for you. So again, if in case you have any questions or something is not clear, just please uh, drop us a mail via the chat uh, box and chat uh, functionality. All right, so we're going to start actually with the first poll question that reads as follows. Have you dealt with tax dispute uh, in your practice? So I'm going to open actually the poll for you and the floor for the 
for uh, please click a if uh, yes uh, you have that with a treaty based uh, map so mutual agreement procedure b in case you dealt with a uh, case regarding the eu arbitration convention uh, c in case it is a domestic law based procedure or d no so i wanted to actually ask you uh, hans and yasna uh, about uh, the Practical implications, of course, of today's topic, uh, today's webinar. Uh, how important is uh, actually in corporate taxation dispute resolution? Um, by now, I think, we, think we, we should say regretfully that disputes are inherent to taxation and probably international taxation even more than domestic taxation. Right. I think recently we saw a report. Uh, stating that um, the CEOs and CFOs of the top 500 of magazine Fortune all report international tax disputes mm. as the major threat they fear most for the next years. Right. So, I mean, this is the... the, the we, uh, we live in controversial mm. times due to all kinds of measurements, BEPs, etc., but also greater knowledge, expertise, awareness of tax authorities, more severe auditing. That, that is the state of play. But do you see a shift, a growing shift towards tax dispute resolution, the, the number of the, of, the, of the volume of these cases or the value of the oh, transaction yeah. structures? Uh, absolutely, absolutely. Yes, right. If you look at OECD and also European statistics, you see that the number of MAP cases initiated by taxpayers is um, uh, increasing mm. each year. Right. Um, and let's say two things, basically, that there are more and more disputes, but also that taxpayers actually do have quite a bit of trust mm -hmm. in MAP, yes. despite whatever yes. we yes. experts say about mm -hmm. MAP. Right. I mean, taxpayers are still not disappointed. Mm. I mean, looking at the you know the BEPS developments or the EU developments, there are a lot of new measures that that can actually act as a catalyst and can actually at the end of the road pursue taxpayers you know to turn some kind of resolution, right? So if you look at you know the OECD new transfer pricing guidelines, uh, MLI, uh, you talk about new concept in it, the new GARs, the new PPTs, mm -hmm. uh, the CFC uh, regulations. So really. It looks that, that we have new drivers, actually, that drive uh, tax disputes uh, in the future. Agree, and I also think that you mentioned OECD transfer pricing guidelines. While they address many issues, they also create new issues. For example, we will, I think, face more dispute with respect of factual facts. They will argue about risk allocation and how do you attribute profits to those, right. for example, for transfer pricing um, disputes. With respect to ATAD, we will see different implementations, different options that it right. uh, allows. So even on a global level, and also if we focus on the EU, with increasing substantive law, we will in few years face an increasing number mm. of disputes and right. double taxation. Yes, oh, thank you. Right, it, it seems to me that the answers are in, and 50% of our viewers answer that they only dealt with domestic law-based uh, uh, procedure, and the other 50% said that they did not deal previously in their practical uh, life or during their practice. Are you surprised, actually, that uh, most of the people do not have experience with either the treaty-based or the EU arbitration case uh, map? Um, I would say not surprised because maybe from a, if we focus on MAP, a lot of people, if a lot of consultants, maybe even law firms do not, law firms especially don't get that involved in that process. Uh, maybe they come at the later stage, um, but sometimes even the taxpayer fears the procedure. Mm -hmm. We had one example where the procedure was uh, ongoing for 12 years. Right. So we noticed some reluctance from the taxpayer and consequently also from consultancy that would advise the taxpayer to go through the trouble and the costs associated right. with it, of course, right. because then um, you end up with uh, 12 years uh, a right. long invoice. So, of course, they saw maybe more reliable, more safe route to go via the national courts. Yeah, right. claim it it's more familiar. Procedures. And yes. I think, mm -hmm. there, I mean, even today, still in many countries, I mean, there is no proper MAP 
procedure open for taxpayers or public guidance available how to access MAP. So even if a taxpayer would want to go to MAP, he simply wouldn't know how to do it. Uh, and that is, I think, a problem that uh, was also highlighted in, um, in BAP's Action 14 report as, and is one of the spearheads of the OECD to improve one of the minimum standards. Correct. I just wanted to point that out, but uh, thank you very much. Well, we will see, I think, at the end of the webinar, you know, what kind of factors can dissuade taxpayers approaching uh, and taking uh, this opportunity. All right, so let's, uh, let's set this, uh, the scene. What, what do we need to know about uh, dispute resolution in general, uh, Hans? Um, well, I mean, <laughs> well, I think most taxpayers that we just learned from the poll and, um, and the answers to it has a sort of familiar inclination, a natural inclination to turn to um, a domestic court resolution. I mean, if you have an international dispute, it won't help you so much. Because at the end of the day, you want to have a resolution that applies to all countries involved, not just one. And to open up, let's say, domestic court procedures in several countries at the same time, that's not, not very effective, apart mm -hmm. from the cost aspect, of course. Um, so you really need to have, let's say, an international instrument right. uh, available. Um, and luckily, I mean, there are not just one, but several um, historically. Um, so we have the famous MAP procedure under many, many bilateral tax treaties, some supplemented by an arbitration clause. Most of them, unfortunately, not, but that may change. Um, since 1995, we have the European Arbitration Convention, specifically for transfer pricing and P profit allocation issues, a limited scope, but nevertheless a very important area. Um, recently, uh, many, many countries uh, have been signing up to the BEPS multilateral instrument, uh, which provides for a very large portion of provisions on arbitration right. uh, to supplement tax treaties of those countries that have opted in mm -hmm. for those um, uh, uh, arbitration clauses. That's an important addition. And now we have the European Directive, which will become uh, F effective as from July next year. Right, right. We discussed previously uh, which one seems to be the most popular among these measures or the least popular. Can you say, they, are they actually popular uh, instruments or ways or means of uh, resolving uh, disputes? I think, well, globally, um, according to OCD statistics, there are, I think, some over 5,000 map cases around. Um, we don't know how many disputes are actually are, but right. popularity, it's not something you like to go to, <laughs> but um, an increasing number of taxpayers know how to find a way. That's encouraging. Um, when it comes to arbitration cases, that's something entirely different. Right. And uh, um, none of them have ever been published. There are no statistics published in this respect, but if you count and count what you hear in the, the, um, the corridors, um, you come up to some 20 cases, just under 20 cases in Europe. And we know that US, the US and Canada have also f completed just under 10 arbitration cases. So a total number, it's about 30 since mm -hmm. 1995. So that's right. not a lot. It's not really pro positive and, uh, <laughs> and promising, actually, for the future, if I uh, may so. Well, I would say this holds true up until now. Mm. And then the directive comes in, because connecting to the results of the poll, the way the procedure was designed, the problems associated with it, the lack of guidance, the lack of access, of course, all resulted in the lack of cases, mm -hmm. because the taxpayers were reluctant to go. They they just didn't use the the map procedure available to them under the treaty but then now we have the directive which addresses these issues i would say even in a more efficient and better way than the mli right. goes further makes the arbitration really mandatory so really puts the stick, stick behind the door and with respect to maps as a first stage really unblocks the procedure yeah 
Yeah. So it really gives the guarantee to the taxpayer. It gives the um, maybe the the feeling that the dispute uh, will really get resolved. So it's right. worth the while of going uh, that route, not just in front of the national court. Right. All right, uh, Hans. I think uh, one of the uh, the factors actually that might uh, scare uh, you know uh, taxpayers away is the this old belief that they are basically excluded from this procedure, so the, the mutual agreement arbitration procedure. Is that true? Yes, I think the old-fashioned way maps were conducted, um, I mean, it's often called a black box. So, I mean, the taxpayer files a complaint, doesn't even know what authorities do with it, whether they engage in map kind of negotiations or not, and when they do, it remains silent for um, for well maybe actually be indefinite the taxpayer is not a party in map um, at best it may be called to act as a witness but only if the authorities themselves want so i mean there's no right to be heard um, uh, many many authorities don't give let's say any let's say um, uh, updates on the process, the way they're going, what kind of arguments have been exchanged between the authorities. So there's also no opportunity whatsoever for taxpayers to steer the process. Right. While in fact, I think the taxpayer input also in that respect could be quite useful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, all right. Anything else to add to this slide, uh, Hans? No, I think, well, what we see, I mean, this, this black box, character um, caused many tax experts to call for a change. And they have mm. been pointing at, let's say, taxpayer rights, human right. rights, rights of fire trial. And I think this is particular what the European Commission has picked up mm -hmm. in designing the new directive. But I assume when you're an advisor or consultant who is involved in this field and who has been working in this field, you, you have some kind of well, best practice for yourself and your clients, how to approach a procedure that, from which you basically are excluded. So how do you steer the taxpayer, your, your client, in a way that it goes through and that there's a, there's a positive uh, result and resolution? Yeah, so what is the trick? Share the, with us. The trick <laughs> is that you have to be a bit aggressive mm. towards the authorities. Authorities mm. actually have a lot to do and um, uh, conducting a map is a very laborious, laborious work. So actually, if you offer help, quite often they are pleased mm. with that help. So the first step is for a taxpayer to spell out in detail what exactly the problem is, what he has experienced in both countries because authorities usually only know the situation in their own country, but not how the situation is in the other country. Right. Right. So that could be very useful. Also, um, ideas of how the situation may be resolved. I mean, competent authorities may be quite creative, but some additional creativity in particular mm. from the taxpayer often helps. Right. And I think the taxpayer just has one aim right to have the whole thing resolved he's not particularly biased towards one or the other position of the tax authorities he just want to have the thing resolved so that is a sort of natural in between uh, position sort of a natural position as a mediator so be be assertive if i understand correctly yes. offer alternatives have ideas how these disputes according to your your opinion can be resolved and then and then present it in a in a, an impressive way. Right. That is, uh, that is <laughs> even the if you're not in the position where I have an acknowledged mm. right to do so. Right. I mean, you give it a try, and you'll find that surprisingly many authorities actually are receptive to it. All right. Oh, brilliant. Thank you, Vidya. Yes, yes. Sir. I would agree. Um, I think first, maybe from a consultant point of view you need to offer to the client end-to-end -end approach. So really to guide him through the procedure. Many taxpayers maybe don't have in-house teams to deal with this or maybe have the specific knowledge, but really get familiar with the procedure, especially now under the directive, where it really gives certain role to the taxpayer. It gives certain involvement. Be aware of the rights he has. We will, of course, dive into those um, later. 
and really be aggressive, really claim every right that the taxpayer has mm. and be cooperative. Present all the facts um, of the dispute beforehand because we received many maybe complaints that the tax authorities deal with lack of cooperation from the taxpayer side. So they are not willing to disclose, describe facts. So right. basically then they are left with only the tools, only the information they have at, uh, at hand. Mm -hmm. So assertive and familiar with the procedure yes. and cooperative. Right. All right. No, great advice. Thank you, uh, guys. Right. We brought this slide actually to discuss uh, the number of uh, recently resolved cases and how they ended up, uh, what was the practical outcome of it. And there was a lively discussion about uh, shall we look at from a positive uh, uh, lens or putting up our positive lens or shall we be particularly negative about the outcome? Uh, what do you think, uh, Hans? So uh, <laughs> shall we be satisfied with yes. the 60% well, I mean, uh, resolved? It, it, as a former competent authority, I like to point out at the 59%, the green mm. part of the circle and say, well, look at how many cases get resolved in time. So it means that for you, the uh, the glass is half empty. Yes, but I mean, in my current capacity, of course, I tend to focus more on the remaining 40%. Right. And, um, well, I think many OCD will probably say, well, I mean, there's a solution in those remaining 40% cases as well. But that's not, I think, the resolution that we should prefer. For instance, look at the brown box, the 90% indicating cases resolved by unilateral relief by one of the states. That's what I call the beggar thy neighbor scenario. Um, that's typically the case where one competent authority simply doesn't want to concede at all during the map mm. negotiations and the other competent authority, usually of the resident country of the taxpayer, more or less out of frustration, out of pity with the taxpayer grants unilateral relief, even though it feels that it really shouldn't. Right. Right. right? So that's not particularly satisfactory. We also have, let's say, uh, uh, the purple box, the 5% cases being withdrawn by the taxpayer. Well, I mean, this was what I label frustration, sheer frustration. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's mm -hmm. not a resolution if a taxpayer out of disappointment there is now in this withdraw the case. Right, I got your point. There is no disincentive, I think, in this directive because if you withdraw the, uh, your, your, your uh, MAP complaint at one moment uh, in time and during this process, yeah. you are going to be charged with the costs. I mean, if you read the directive, it says if the taxpayer withdraws, the, yes. some of the costs are going to be actually covered or need to be covered by the taxpayer. So I think it's going to be a disincentive. All right. Uh, Yasna, your view on it? Uh, shall we look at it from a positive perspective and be satisfied with it? or? No, absolutely not. Because if we look at those statistics, those are, of course, based on the facts from previous years, from 2016. Right. Yeah. So that was before the implementation of Action 14, both on the OECD and the EU level. Mm -hmm. So I like to believe that the green circle will increase. Right, right. Um, All right. So I, I sh we shouldn't be satisfied with those numbers. Mm. All right, yes. well, thank you. And I think by the end of the day, we shall see that the green part of the circle also include scores of successful arbitrations. Mm because mm. the results of arbitrations are affected through MAP, yes. right? So um, that will also lead to and, a further increase of a more satisfactory way of resolving cases. Right, and in, in, in just in uh, your view uh, shortly, uh, if we meet in five or ten years time, how is this uh, chart going to look like? Look well, into your crystal ball. Oh, uh, right. <laughs> Ideally, the entire circle should be green. But do you believe in it? So that, for example, due to the new directive that is going to happen, so that green, green ratio portion chart is going to actually increase? Oh, absolutely. That's, mm. I'm convinced that will be the case. Right. Um, how much? I think it will. Actually, I, I, I feel it will be considerably mm. this All increase. Right. All right. Let's see what might cause that increase. But first, uh, one question to our viewers. 
uh, how does the new EU directive fit into the system of dispute resolution? So what do you think about the new right directive? Does it have supremacy, supremacy over the EU arbitration convention and treaty-based procedure? It annuls the EU arbitration convention and has supremacy over a treaty-based procedure or it builds upon the EU arbitration convention and runs in parallel with treaty-based procedure? Uh, what do you think about this? Please click A, B, or C. Uh, Yasna, you want to add something to this slide, how we can perhaps interpret this slide? Maybe with respect to the, um, to the point C. So what is meant here is more the question that if not runs in parallel as a procedure itself, but if the e-arbitration convention is still applicable as the directive is applicable and also the treaty-based procedure are applicable, and then basically the taxpayer can have the right to choose between those instruments. So basically it seems that there are not even more alternatives. You can have the treaty-based map and arbitration in case it's available, the uh, arbitration convention mm -hmm. and the new EU directive as well. Right? Majority argues for that. Of course, there are so also some opinions which would say no, but the taxpayer within the EU, so between member states to member mm -hmm. state relation, must first rely on the directive and only then on the treaty arbitration. Some say that they only have access to the directive and neither did the European Commission or the OECD really release any position on mm -hmm. that point. So I think it will be important to see how this will develop right. in practice. But maybe from a practical uh, perspective, I would say try all of them. Maybe mm -hmm. as a, do a strategy tree, decide what's best for your uh, client in, on the, as a case at hand. Um, of course, depends also on the facts, depends on the country position, on the MLI, depends on the country position of the residents, uh, if it's a member state. So all these factors you need to take into account, um, decide under which procedure the outcome is really guaranteed, uh, also depends on the countries involved, um, and then decide what's best for the taxpayer. And uh, I think we really need practical cases to see right. how, um, right. how to address this question. All right. All right. But at a practical level, the directive actually tries to prevent uh, simultaneous procedures, right? So it says if you actually launch, let's say, the, EU, uh, the, the new, new directive, so a new procedure under the new directive, then it puts an end to any kind of treaty-based uh, or arbitration convention-based procedure. Indeed. If the, yeah, if the taxpayer would initiate, if the, it would choose a procedure under the directive, initiates the, a MAP procedure under the directive, that puts a pause on other procedures right. if they're initiated. Right. Right. Um, of course, in my understanding, even if there's no outcome, which I don't think it will happen because it's really have a lot of unblocking uh, tools, it could potentially still rely on the treaty-based procedure. Mm -hmm. But of course, mm -hmm. then you have to take into account the duration and if the taxpayer would be willing to, after certain years of right. procedure under the directive, right. really right. go with the same country under it's basically the same procedure yes. right and I but would, i think yeah. i think the main the main aim of the directive is to secure that whatever choice the taxpayer makes whatever other procedures is being mm. followed there will always be a solution right. and in time mm. that is yeah. what mm. this, that's the security to taxpayers right. that the new so directive a, intends to give a clear way right. essentially to the dispute yes. resolution. That is, is resolved. Exactly. Be assured, there's a guarantee basically Absolutely. built in. There's yes. a resolution. All right. Mm -hmm. What else do we need to know about the objective, purpose, and the scope of the directive? Yeah. Well, I'm happy we moved to this point because now we can finally be a bit more positive, um, mm. because this is where we all see the game changer, the directive. It brings, the, let's say, the light at the end of the tunnel of the MAP procedure. It gives uh, certain guarantees, as we already mentioned. It unblocks um, the procedure. But the first point, which is the most important, it extends the scope. So before we mentioned that the EU Arbitration Convention, it only uh, was applicable for transfer pricing disputes. Now this directive concerns all tax disputes arising between more, two or more member states where there is a treaty or a convention concluded between them. So that's the first uh, important point, that the subject matter is extended. Then there are certain ways, certain safeguards um, that guarantee that the procedure actually moves forward, that it's not stuck. Uh, for example, um, in practice it was really proven problematic that sometimes the tax authorities would just not reply to a complaint or would 
deny it unjustifiably. Mm. Now we have this, let's say, safeguard when the authority has to act. And it also, if it decides to reject the complaint, it has to give a justification. It has to provide an opinion to the taxpayer. Right. Then we have further tools. Um, for example, if, the, if both um, concerned uh, member states deny the complaint, the taxpayer can actually go to the national court and complain about the admissibility of the complaint. Mm. Um, and so, so they involve, the, the directive involves the national courts to a certain extent and gives this, uh, let's say, unblocking um, tools to the procedure so that right. the procedure keeps on moving. Right. The same goes with if we really come to the stage that after unsuccessful MAP, we need to go to the arbitration stage and we have troubles with uh, composing advisory commission. Mm -hmm. Then again, we could rely on the national court um, and request that the national court nominates the independent person. Right. Uh, let me ask uh, specifically about the scope. So just to clarify it, uh, this directive only applies if there's a double tax treaty between the two M EU member states mm -hmm or uh, they are signatories to the arbitration convention, right? So then it means that automatically, uh, per definition, third country issues, when I have a, do I have a permanent establishment in a third country, uh, um, how we classify the income, uh, the taxpayer, these issues are out of scope for the directive because it's really between EU member states and those countries that are signatories of the arbitration convention. Exactly, or have a treaty concluded between them. Right. Because the, on this point, it's also important to uh, to have the right version of the directive in front of us, because when the proposal was first released, the scope was even wider. It really included all tax disputes, regardless of whether there is a treaty between those two member states or not. Uh, which then, throughout the nego negotiation procedure in front of the council, we came to the final version um, that now basically requires that there is a tax treaty or a convention between mm -hmm. two mm -hmm. member states. Because even nowadays we have certain situations where we don't yet have a tax treaty between two member states. Right, I think so too. I think so. There are actually several member states, around five mm. member states yes. that don't have uh, treaties with each other. So. Or where the treaty has been terminated. Right, right. It's like right. Denmark and Malta. Yes, okay. indeed. Yeah. So indeed. that that's indeed. then links to what uh, we were saying before, that you really have to assess on a case-by-case -case basis um, look at the facts of your client and see if first the, the procedure under directive is even um, mm -hmm. applicable. We have, a, decide. we have a question about this actually, whether uh, the procedures uh, are equally valid for uh, cases involving uh, individuals and individual uh, taxes and uh, corporate taxes as well. Uh, indeed, it covers both, uh, let's say, it covers issues from direct taxation and also from capital uh, and other gains. So it includes individuals. And in my opinion, it even provides more comfort and more guarantee for individuals because, of course, amounts in the case of individuals are a bit lower. So those people are, yeah, they're more, maybe even more reluctant to go through right. the trouble. And yeah. with the directive um, for the individuals, even the procedure is a bit simplified. Mm -hmm. um, so maybe it's important also to distinguish between them, uh, between both. But I think it's also as a maybe as a for lawyers and the consultants or individual clients mm -hmm. uh, to present this option and to uh, present it as something positive, like a positive mm -hmm. development mm -hmm. that there is now an additional way of double taxation relief and it's worth uh, worth fighting for. Uh, thank you. We have another question and it concerns whether uh, in order a case to be covered, essentially it must concern a tax that is covered by the tax treaty. So it means, for example, if uh, it's a dispute about VAT that is not under a tax treaty, so possibly then, does it mean then that the, that the directive is not applicable? Yes, I think that it's without the scope right. uh, of the directive. And uh, I think that's, I would say, a topic for further work <laughs> mm -hmm. for the com commission um, to provide also satisfying dispute resolution mechanisms for those other areas. Right. But it's true, I think the, uh, the the reach of this instrument is limited to what is within the scope of the tax treaty in mm -hmm. play. Mm -hmm. And uh, the same goes for the MLI, by the way. Um, yeah, it is, it's, it's, it's hung up, it's hooked up right. to the scope of the um, tax treaty, the mm. individual tax mm. treaty in play. That's inevitable. Right. And uh, I think, well, 
Maybe in future, Jasna, <laughs> um, we will see a widening of the scope of the directive uh, to cover all international disputes, whatever the nature may be, whatever the course of um, the dispute may be, whether there's a tax treaty in play or not. Mm -hmm. But then we're talking about a truly European vicinity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And yes, why did you point out here and highlighted the, the example of Finland? Um, that relates to the, our discussion of where does the EU directive fit in the whole treaty um, based um, framework. Because uh, an interesting example of Finland, they made a reservation to the MLI. So they opted in for the arbitration chapter, but they made a reservation that in relation between member state and member state, the EU law has supremacy over MLI, over the tax treaty, consequently. Right. Uh, so that was the only country that uh, we came across that made a, such a really specific and explicit reservation, but of course opens the door to our discussion. Mm -hmm. Does that mean that um, per se EU law has supremacy or quite the opposite, right. that you really right. have to make an explicit reservation that and give the EU law supremacy over the MLI. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. arguments can go both right. ways right. and yeah. as said before, we will really have to see the how it will be applied in practice. Mm -hmm. yes. Interesting, interesting. Yeah. interesting. All right, let's go to poll question number uh, three that reads as follows. Uh, given the recent changes of the MLI and the adoption of the EU directive, which procedure do you regard as more efficient and providing a guaranteed outcome? So please click A if uh, te tax treaty based procedure, uh, the procedure based on EU um, directive, that's option B. C, uh, click C if uh, despite the changes I prefer legal remedies under domestic law or D, neither. I assume here we ask the opinion and view of our uh, viewers uh, prior to our discussion, so we don't want to actually kind of make them biased towards the new directive. Yeah. <laughs> uh, new directive. Uh, but do you think it's a welcome? Uh, there, there has been some time uh, actually passed uh, since the directive is adopted. Do you think it's a welcome uh, uh, development uh, from the side of the tax community? Welcome, I think I would call it a necessity. Mm. Um, and um, well, my tribute initiative, one of the main things that we are pressing for is the inclusion of what we call a default procedure. Right. Uh, and that is a procedure that becomes obligatory if authorities would remain sitting on their hand and forsake their obligation to arbitrate by simply not setting up an arbitration. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what the directive does. Moreover, it gives the taxpayer the right to turn to a domestic court and enforce the creation of um, uh, the advisory commission, the arbitration panel. Correct. So, I mean, actually, the taxpayer now has all ties in his right. own hands. Right. So you are the advocate of uh, option uh, B in this case, the procedure based on EU directive. Yeah. Yeah, that's what that's what Oh, absolutely. Choose. Yes. Right. Mm. Yasna, you agree? Yes. And even we didn't yet mention another important point, the transparency. Right. So it uh, basically eliminates the black box. The decisions under the directive, they need to be published with the consent. And even if there's no consent there, you have the reducted version. But in any case, it goes through the stage that the decisions are published. And that gives also, of course, again, a stick behind the door. It forces the competent authorities to come up with a reasonable solution. Mm, mm, mm. And well, also gives maybe some kind of certainty to the taxpayer because, of course, the, is not a, the value of the decisions doesn't have a presidential value. But, right. of, of course, there's more, just more guarantee, more transparency. Um, it just makes the whole procedure, I think, more pro-taxpayer and gives the, nece the necessary legitimacy. All right. Well, I'm pleased to uh, say that 70% of our viewers went for option B, so the procedure based on EU directive. So let's see, actually, we are right or not about that, and uh, we can share our satisfaction. So what do we know about the effective dates and the implementation of, uh, of the directive? Well, the directive was already adopted. Um, that's now it's already a year ago, almost. Um, so yes, uh, and I think despite the adoption already a year ago, 
the awareness is still a bit behind. Mm -hmm. um, and why I say that, because I think it's important to keep in mind that it already applies for the tax disputes that relate to the income earned as of 1st of January 2018. Right. And the, apl the application um, then of the directive is for complaints submitted after the 1st of July, which is also the date when the directive mm -hmm. already has to be transposed into national law. And even in addition, the competent authorities can agree together that they will even use this procedure for tax disputes that arose from earlier financial years. Mm. So it's not something for the future. Um, I really believe it's here. Um, the role of practitioners is to get acquainted with the procedures, uh, to inform the client and already to monitor um, potential issues this year because yeah, they can already sub, uh, submit a complaint yes. as of 1st of July. I would say it's even worth try, trying to, for example, maybe it uh, would be clearer if I give an example. If you would have a dispute arising for financial year 2017, 2018, mm -hmm. 2019, and all of them are based on the same facts, Yes. I would say it would make sense to at least try to argue that they should use this procedure under the directive for mm. all of the years mm. because then you could end up in a situation hypothetically where you would apply the directive for year 2018 and 2019 and then for the year 2017 you would go under the treaty right. map right so right. i think in those cases the competent authorities mm. would act reasonably and apply the directive well, possibly it's one assessment uh, conducted exactly right, for or, the so entire can, assessment yes. yeah, regardless of the actual yes. years right i see yeah. all right Let's move on and talk about some practical considerations. So how is the flow of this uh, procedure? So this uh, chart gives a really brief overview. Um, we indicated it with different colors to make it more clear. So the red color really indicates the, um, the moment when the double taxation occurs, when the taxpayer makes a complaint, um, and then the, the competent authority uh, of course, also notifies the, the taxpayer the, the, that the, uh, decides on the admissibility, either agrees with it or not. And of course, also, the or you can see on the chart, it has certain time limits, because that's an important element, that these time limits are now really strict, they're enforceable, because if the competent authority doesn't, for example, uh, reply to the complaint, this is considered as an acceptance which means that procedure goes so further. implicit acceptance yeah. of, the, exactly. of the complaint, right? And then, right. as we mentioned before, if both of the competent authorities would uh, deny the complaint, the taxpayer could go to the, uh, to the national court, um, appeal that the complaint is in fact admissible. If the national court would agree with the taxpayer, we then shift to the mutual agreement procedure. Mm, I see. And then we have, again, a strict time limit of two years with one year of potential um, extension. We hopefully reach a mutual agreement. And if not, then we really reach the mandatory dispute resolution stage, also known as tax arbitration. Right. So here right. we have this really an obligation that if after, let's say, two plus one years, we don't have an outcome, right. uh, the procedure shifts to the dispute resolution mm. stage. And here we have to then, um, the competent authorities first have to appoint the advisory commission. Again, if that doesn't happen, we can resort to the national court as mm -hmm. a taxpayer. Let's say in a way, um, force that again, the procedure goes further. Then the advisory commission gives an opinion. And that opinion of the advisory commission goes to the competent authority based on which the authorities make the final decision. Right. And then right. that, that final decision needs to be notified to the taxpayer and implemented on national level of both uh, member states. Right. Just for further to elaborate actually the slide for and, and this uh, graphical chart for our uh, viewers, what does it mean you indicate uh, actually one of the, the, the lot of numbers? Uh, <laughs> in, in one case, you indicate it's a two plus three plus three plus six months. What, what does it mean actually this time period? Exactly. What do we refer there? Um, so normally the taxpayer uh, makes a complaint. Mm -hmm. Then the competent authority needs to reply to it in two months. However, it can also request the taxpayer to present more facts. So to complete right. the complaint, then you have the three months deadline that they do so. Then after the taxpayer has done so, you have another three months um, mm -hmm. 
Mm. So then those are really the specifics, which I believe as a practitioner, we need to dive into and to understand and explain it to the taxpayer because right. a taxpayer will not be familiar with those mm. really nitty gritty details. Um, and there, those are the options. Right, I see. So there are information requests that might prolong exactly. actually the, 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 the procedure. And then uh, something uh, to discuss about the, the number of phases here. Um, why do you think the Commission opted for having a final decision at the end by the competent authority? So why is it not an option that after the advisory uh, commission delivers its opinion, that opinion is automatically binding? Why did we need to include a final decision by the competent authorities? Um, well, I mean, you see the same thing <laughs> in uh, the multilateral instrument mm -hmm. and also under the OECD uh, model. Um, I think the uh, I mean I haven't seen I haven't seen any official explanation, but my understanding is that is basically to prevent any let's say what I call lawmaking by the arbitral panel, any ruling that might let's say not be entirely supported by the text of the treaty provisions. Right. So this is an escape actually for the authorities for a case like that to say, well, I mean, this is difficult for us to defend. We probably don't uh, have the authority to agree a solution which is not sufficiently supported by the language of the tax treaty. In that case, they can, no, they must agree within a limited time frame on a different solution. Right. If they don't, either because they don't uh, see a need for it or um, simply can't agree within that limited period in time, then indeed the um, decision of the advisory commission becomes binding. So it is a small leeway they have to come to the census and um, agree something differently for whatever right. reason. This is not, let's say, um, uh, extraordinary because mm -hmm. we see similar provisions quite often also uh, in a commercial arbitration. Right, right. So basically, essentially, if I understand correctly, uh, they can deviate to a certain extent from the solution that is proposed by the arbitration uh, commission. However, they either need to resolve, actually, they need to resolve the, the dispute. If they don't, because they don't agree, then the arbitration commission's opinion becomes binding um, yes. after six months. All right. I think there's some people argue that this is not really binding arbitration. I would say it's conditionally binding arbitration. Mm -hmm. I can mm -hmm. use probably mm -hmm. a, a proper, mm -hmm. more proper terminology. And going back to a further or a, a previous stage, actually, what is the difference if if the uh, if one or both uh, competent authorities denies actually the admissibility of the case? Well, in case the co one of the competent authorities would deny it, uh, because maybe to take a step back, so in parallel, the taxpayer has to make a complaint to both of the member states. Right. Then, as we said, if both of them deny it, the taxpayer can appeal to the national court. If only one of them denies it, then we have um, this longer arrow, which uh, we then... The advisory commission is appointed, it was on right. the admissibility, and then we return to the mutual agreement mm, uh, mm, procedure. Mm, so right. it's a bit complex. The flowchart tries to present it in a simplified way. It's right. still, I think, very complex yes. um, mm. because you really have to make a nuance between, as you say, if only one rejects it, what happens if two, both of the member states reject it? Mm. And you need to know the steps of um, of both situations. Yes. All right. And I think right. this this op this uh, opportunity to have a denial of map access tested by mm. a local court is extremely valuable. Right. Mm. This was, I think, one of the main loopholes under the old Union Arbitration Convention. Uh, take, for instance, the example where one company authority refuses to cooperate in a map because he allegedly says there has been tax fraud on the, on the mm. part of the taxpayer. The other competent authority disagrees. Well, under the um, uh, arbitration convention, no map and no arbitration was possible under that, uh, in that situation, but there was no authority to whatever body 
right. uh, to test whether that denial of access mm -hmm. on the allegations of tax fraud was actually justified. Right. Now we have this possibility to have this denial tested. Mm. So that's a big improvement. If I understand and I read correctly, the directive also the the, the, the actually the the reasons the tax the tax administration can give for the denial is rather limited, right? So to deny the complaint, there are certain given predetermined reasons um, out of the scope. Uh, there is no actual dispute. The time frame passed. Uh, the right information wasn't submitted. So it's really yes. limited. Uh, actually. Yes, but nevertheless, I mean, they applied quite frequently. Mm. Um, for instance, penalties. There's also an exclusion right. for a case where a penalty has been imposed. We have seen cases in practice where one authority denied map access on the grounds that a penalty was imposed for a late filing of right. a tax return. A very minor offense, a very minor penalty. Now, should that satisfy to block map yes. an arbitration? I yes. think that is that is right. very right. disputable. And uh, the final question about this slide from my side. You mentioned national court. Which one? Any, both, uh, <laughs> taxpayer decides? Depends on the national law. Mm. So it would really vary among the member states. In some countries it will be the administrative court. Some countries have a specific tax court. Maybe it's a civil court. So one's, one really then has to look into the national court of, of course, both member states and see, um, see the relevant court. But in this case, where did really you appeal to the for the admissibility, you have to appeal at the court of the residence and the taxpayer. Right. Right. So that's right. an important. Right. Uh, no, it's good to to clarify. Yes. Thank you very much. All right. Uh, the next slide. It's still in the within the practical consideration. It's a different. The perfect scenario. What is the perfect scenario? <laughs> Rarely happens, but <laughs> if it would, uh, well, the taxpayer would uh, inform. Um, would file a complaint to both of the competent authorities at the same time. Uh, the competent authorities would then have to inform the taxpayer within two months. The mutual agreement procedure would start. A mutual agreement would be reached in two years. And then the agreement would be notified to the taxpayer and implemented by the member states. Right. So if we look then on the left side of the slide at the time limits provided for that, we would come to a procedure between two to 6.5 years from when the double taxation occurs. And maybe this seems as a wide window, but it really depends on when the taxpayer takes, takes the action and submits right. the complaint, because it has three years to do so as of the date when the double taxation um, occurred. So that's why the window is so broad. So if it would right. really file the complaint on the first day mm -hmm. it was notified, mm -hmm. then it would be, let's say, best case scenario around two years. If it, if the taxpayer would wait for three years, then we would really have 6.5 mm -hmm. years mm -hmm. as of the day that the double taxation occurred. Right, right. As a devil's advocate, may I ask, why does the, the, the directive require that uh, uh, the complaint is filed for both? member states so both competent authority so the, as far as I remember in case of treaties or the EU arbitration convention is enough that you submit the complaint to one of them mm. so why do you think uh, the European lawmaker is actually opted for an option that uh, you need to file the uh, complaint for both uh, it doesn't seem to be very taxpayer friendly <laughs> You know, oh no! I, mean, I always opposite, huh? I <laughs> always advise clients to do this, mm. even mm. without an obligation, because the the situation that you would want to avoid is that um, uh, one authority drops your request, your complaint in the dustbin, and the other authority even doesn't even know that you have a complaint, right? right? Mm. Um, so I mean, if you file your complaint with both authorities then uh, the authority that actually feels a map would be uh, appropriate in this case can actually approach the other authority right. and say, well, hey, have you f uh, received the complaint? Mm. I have. What mm. are you going to do about it? I see. I see. Um, uh, the directive makes this the main situation. I wouldn't call it an obligation. Mm. It's, I think it's normal procedure. Right. 
Um, but I think the, 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 the um, directive takes into account that in particular for an individual or a small company, an SME, this might be quite burdensome uh, because you have to take into account that there may be a requirement that the complaint is filed in the national language of the authority. Uh, and that doesn't re relate only to the uh, right. to the letter, but right. also to um, uh, documentation that you right. want to send in together with mm -hmm. your complaint. Mm -hmm. um, so basically, to relieve uh, individuals or small companies with a limited purse from that additional burden, there is a possibility to right. file just with right. the um, authority of your own country in your own domestic language. Right. Yes. All right. Okay. Thank you for uh, making that uh, clear. Let's go on to the less perfect scenario. So in this uh, scenario, we have the same stage for the first stage. So the taxpayer has a double taxation, files a complaint. However, now the mutual agreement is not reached. So here in practice, there were a lot of problems already with the first orange box. So setting up the advisory commission. Um, so first, uh, the advisory commission needs to be set up by the competent authorities, which basically means that they have to agree on who will be uh, who will be the members of the advisory commission. Um, so let's say that everything goes well, they set up the advisory commission, and then the advisory commission re gives a final opinion, which is followed by the final decision by the competent authorities, and then this gets notified and implemented by the member states. So if you would really be in the situation where our procedure would face the second stage, so the dispute resolution stage, it's estimated, calculated, this will take from 3.5 years to 8 years. Mm. So again, it can be very fast if the taxpayer acts fast, files a complaint after the taxation has occurred. Um, but we have a lot of, let's say, a lot of time limits in between, a lot of procedural matters the setting up right. the advisory commission in between. Well, right. So that, of course, all prolongs the procedure. Mm. But the key message here is that there is an endpoint. We will come to an outcome because now we even, in some cases, saw 12 years for only the MAP stage. We didn't even reach the arbitration stage. And this right. is really the asset of the directive. It really makes the, the orange, the stage, the dispute resolution stage um, present. It will happen. At mm -hmm. a certain stage, if you don't reach mm -hmm. a mutual agreement. Some commentators highlight practical deficiencies in the directive. So, for example, they say, well, if a mutual agreement procedure is not, uh, is not uh, uh, successful, so the agreement is not reached, then uh, there is no notification, set a no deadline, actually, to send the notification to the taxpayer about that, sorry, we did not reach the, uh, mm -hmm. an agreement. Another one, actually, that I... Uh, commonly read uh, where it highlights that uh, this, the, the taxpayer needs to actually request the setup of the advisory committee. Whereas, for example, in case of the arbitration convention, as far as I can recall, it is automatic. So the tax administration say, well, we couldn't reach actually the mutual mm -hmm. agreement procedure, so we set up the arbitration com uh, arbitration uh, mm -hmm. as well. Other one that the final opinion is not necessarily communicated to the taxpayer. So it is sent to the tax administrations, but not to the taxpayer. I'm wondering, and, and, and know, that, <laughs> know that, of course, you are not uh, the legislators, but uh, do you agree with these commentators, or are they particularly negative? No, I think it's wrong, actually. Mm. I mean, first of all, I mean, we still count on authorities to set up the commission by their own initiative. Right. It's only when they don't mm. that the taxpayer has uh, the possibility, the right, to force them to do so. <laughs> right. But, I mean, we still are counting on the authorities to mm. do it voluntarily. I see. Um, there is also an obligation under the directive for authorities to share everything that's been agreed on the procedure of the commissions with the taxpayer, right? No black box. Mm -hmm. Everything, starting with timelines, uh, composition of the uh, the panels, um, uh, documentation being sent in, and also the decision. And if they don't, the taxpayer can also enforce that right. via domestic right. court. Right. Um, 
so I mean, I th no, I think everything that can go wrong is covered by mm. the directive. I see. All right, all right. Let's. See. But we're still hoping. <laughs> right. It will not be necessary. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Well, I believe that there are still certain little, let's say, loopholes. Maybe that's an exaggeration, but sometimes when. In, on some point of the directive, there is a notification obligation on the company authorities, but there right. is no deadline to it. Exactly. I know which point you're referring to, and I think here it's uh, we have to rely on the trust. We have to trust the company authority right. to do so. Right. But with practice, those points might prove problematic. But I hope that they will not be so crucial that this will now block the procedure, mm, yeah. because mm. the taxpayer will have um, will have guarantees and I think this we can also link again to the fact that the taxpayer has to be assertive, has to be really involved yes. in the procedure, know its rights and uh, claim its rights. Right, to drive well, I think, forward. I mean, yes. if the taxpayer has filed a request and doesn't hear anything within the given time frame under directive, he has the right to uh, take it for granted that his request has mm -hmm. been accepted. Yeah. And of course, I mean, no steps will be taken by the authorities to appoint a commission. So, I mean, the taxpayer can immediately proceed to the local court and say, well, I can trust that my uh, request has been accepted, even though I haven't heard anything, purely right. because the time has right. elapsed. And now I want a commission mm. to be appointed. Mm. And I think the first thing that the local court will do is ask the authorities, well, I mean, are you going to agree on the on the on the installation mm. of a commission or not, Correct. or should I do it? So I think even in this respect, I don't think there is actually a loophole. The procedure itself may be a little bit complicated, yeah. and may have been arranged, let's say, in a somewhat more efficient manner. Mm. But I think I wouldn't say that there is a loophole. Right. Yeah. All and right. So from a policy perspective, mm -hmm. just as a conclusion. Um, the member states are not left alone to implement this um, on their own and figure out these uh, unclear grey areas. Um, the Commission is taking active steps and also the, the member states are cooperating amongst each other, learning from each other. So, of course, they're, not all the member states are experts on this field, but I believe that, uh, of course, after the directive is adopted, you also have the implementation regulation. Right. So there will be further guidance um, right. to so, close this. Uh, so common calls. sense and good view of you fill yes. in the gaps, right? Uh, <laughs> exactly. All right. So what about the worst case scenario? Well, so this uh, example really then proves um, and shows the the tools that the taxpayer has it, as it, at its disposal. So it shows how if the procedure goes wrong, then we can still steer it towards a solution. So for example, here we already mentioned that um, the taxpayer files a complaint. If it's rejected by both uh, competent authorities, it can appeal in front of the national court. Then the national court only rules on the admissibility. It doesn't go into the substance of the dispute. It doesn't dive into the treaty um, or the facts of the case. So it only decides if the, the complaint is admissible or not. And then if it decides it is, it returns it to the competent authorities and the mutual agreement procedure is started. Then, for example, if the mutual agreement procedure, uh, mutual agreement is not reached within the prescribed time uh, limit, we go again to the second stage. So right. we are then in the dispute resolution stage. We need to set up the advisory commission. Um, we have a final opinion by the advisory commission. Um, of course, many things can go wrong also on this aspect, but for this uh, example, let's assume everything goes smooth. Goes smooth. Um, and then we have a final decision by the competent authorities, which is then notified to the taxpayer, but it's not implemented. So what I find interesting is that then the directive, again, gives another tool to unblock the procedure, and as Hans already mentioned, it allows the taxpayer to go in front of the tax, uh, in front of the national court, right. and demand enforcement of mm. that decision. Mm. All right. And that maybe an important point I think it will also link to what Hans uh, will say later: the court, the national court, can only deny the enforcement, the implementation of the decision, if it says that there was lack of independence of the advisory commission. 
otherwise what does it mean because <laughs> some some argue that this is again a black box as uh, it is used the terminology of hans what does it mean that there's a lack of independence uh, on the side of the advisory commission well i mean the the the, uh, the directive has quite strict rules mm -hmm. on who qualifies for appointment right in these commissions an advisory or an adr commission and actually, I mean, so basically what you see is, I mean, it's in, for, an, for, for a, a private practitioner um, who's still active or has been active um, for the last three years as well, it's impossible mm -hmm. to become a member uh, of, uh, of such a commission. Um, that is a very heavy requirement because it basically rules out any private practitioner um, and that's a pity for basically for two reasons first of all i mean you can be a private practitioner but neither yourself nor your firm has any relation either with the case or the taxpayer um, in question so i mean you can still be perfectly neutral right but nevertheless disqualified mm -hmm. Um, secondly, private practitioners have a proven expertise of mm -hmm. many, many issues that can be in play in, um, in the dispute. And quite often there are issues that require high expertise. Mm -hmm. And I mean, if you want, let's say, the proper people to man the commissions and you limit yourself only to an academic or a judge, I think you're missing out a lot of available expertise. Mm. Right. So this is one thing that I still have a, a, a critical <laughs> comment on. Right. Regarding that you that you record. can't be involved, right? <laughs> I see. I see yeah, your point right. now. I and see. Especially what is uh, which, which can prove problematic is that it's the national court that will decide who is independent and who is not, and the directive doesn't provide any guidance on it. Mm. Um, so first, the question is, at which law will they look at uh, the National Court? Where, on which basis will they decide what's independence? Um, from where do we draw guidelines? And in my opinion, uh, international commercial arbitration has really um, importantly developed that aspect. They have IBA guidelines on conflict of interest, where the factors and the reasons for um, independence mm. or lack of such are completely different than those right. of stated in the directive mm. that are conditions for one to be appointed as advisory mm -hmm. commission there mm -hmm. for example if mm -hmm. you were a lawyer that defended that client in the last five years and so on so it's really right. in my view that's the independence so it's limited more narrowed actually it's to subjective certain, uh, it's more yes. really the it looks at the relationship right. between the the practitioner and the taxpayer it doesn't look at the background of right. the practitioner right. in an isolated right. manner yeah. as the directive does. So right. I agree with right. Hans. It's really, I think, um, so This is perhaps the weakness. weakest... Uh, yeah, the weakest point. link. Yeah. Right. Yes, and exactly. I think also what is also quite ineffective, this policing of qualification and mm. requirements being met, I mean, it's only afterwards, once, the mm. panels have done their work, right? And, uh, and, and one of the competent authorities has a problem. Um, but, I mean, all that work has been done entirely unnecessary then. Mm -hmm. So the policing actually should be done before the commission starts its mm -hmm. work. Right. And right. You, there is nobody, no, no possibility um, to do that kind of policing. Mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. that, is, that is definitely uh, a miss in the, um, in the layout of the directive. Mm. This, this, this list actually from which the different arbitrators can be chosen, it's managed by the European Commission as far as I understood, wouldn't have been that a good solution to put this right to the commission perhaps actually to decide whether the person qualifies to be on the list or not. And then... Indeed, and um, I mean in the directive there's also um, an, let's say an open door under the article that provides for alternative dispute resolution right. and there are, for, there are some pushes towards designing something um, mm -hmm. more permanent, so we'll see to which extent, something more uh, independent uh, right. and that the policing would happen already at that level. Yes. Those issues mm -hmm. then in practice would mm -hmm. not 
not arise. And I think if we really reach that development, that would be great for the taxpayers because right. then you eliminate those issues, you shorten the, our timeline, you reach the solution in a much faster way. Right. Yes. You right. give a, a solid framework mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. and certainty. All right, let's uh, move on to the following uh, penultimate uh, poll question number four, which uh, reads as follows. What are the conse consequences of not replying to a complaint? So imagine that you submit a complaint, but you don't receive um, within the required time frame uh, an answer. So please click A if you think termination of the procedure, double taxation uh, remains. B if taxpayer needs to submit the complaint to the other member state. C in case you agree with uh, following the silence is deemed as an acceptance of the complaint. Or D if you think the silence is deemed as rejection of the complaint. So uh, I think we have discussed that uh, actually. So let's wait and see uh, what the viewers uh, think about it. I see that the answers are coming in. Um, it should be 100% <laughs> right. This is a task. I, can, <laughs> I see the answers are coming in. And uh, indeed, I, I actually, I can acknowledge that we are at 100%. <laughs> and 100% good or, or, or bad. All right, I don't want to deal with it. Anyway, so uh, majority of the viewers, uh, I think, got it right. The silence is deemed as an acceptance of the complaint. So is C is the correct uh, answer. All right, uh, we move on uh, with the other practical considerations. We have partially talked about this, uh, actually. So I don't know how long we need to deal with it. The rights of the taxpayer. So what, what do we need to actually uh, um, tell here? No, I think if you, if you look at where the directive distinguishes itself from the uh, former arbitration right. convention and more particularly from bilateral tax treaties and the MLI, then it's exactly on this issue, the right of the taxpayer to enforce, to force the authorities to do the, the right thing. And that's entirely missing in the other instruments. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it is knowing that your complaint is being looked into. And if your complaint is being denied, that you can turn to a local court right. and have it tested. Knowing that there will be a commission installed to look into your complaint. And if it's not, that you can turn to uh, your local court to have one appointed. Um, knowing exactly what that commission is going to do, what its proceedings, procedural rules will be. If you're not informed, again, you can go to your local court to have the authorities forced to share it with you. Ordinary, I think you should also have a right as a taxpayer to be heard by the commission. Now, that right has been provided, but unfortunately, that has been made subject to consent of the competent authorities. This is something I would like to have seen removed, the necessary consent. I right. think it should be up to the commission whether they want to hear a taxpayer or not. And I'm pretty sure that all commissions would, li would love to hear the views mm. of the taxpayer, mm. because the taxpayer is the one who actually has the same mission as the commissions. They want the case resolved one mm -hmm. way or another. That's exactly the duty of the commission. Mm. And the taxpayer is not biased ordinarily towards right. one of the, well, the competent authorities always are biased. Mm -hmm. um, and then finally, the right to enforcement, also extremely important. Once the decision has been cast, the resolution has been uh, uh, accepted by the company authorities, the taxpayer should be able to enforce um, uh, authorities living up to that resolution. And also for that purpose, the taxpayer right. can go to right. a local court. Now that's still, let's say, depending on national laws, whether the taxpayer has that right or not, national laws are not important anymore. It has all been provided for by the so, 
directive. If I understand you correctly, Hans, is a great improvement in this regard, the directive? Absolutely. Uh, uh, generally, if you look at arbitration, mm -hmm. enforcement, in particular by third parties, is a big right. issue. And uh, I'm, I'm really proud mm -hmm. to see that in tax arbitration, that has mm -hmm. now been resolved right. satisfactorily. Right. Right. So the only point where you could or we could actually put some criticism or level some criticism towards the directive is whether the uh, taxpayer must be heard. So that's not enough that the taxpayer mm -hmm. himself would like to present his perspective. There needs to be some kind of consent or the, at least the, uh, the uh, yes. advisory commission needs to agree. And in some cases, consent yes. is required. In any case, the... at least that's my view, it that's should fair. not be yeah. made subject to the consent of mm -hmm. the competent mm -hmm. authorities. All right. Uh, you praised the, the role of the national court, so I assume it is uh, pretty much the same. Would you like to elaborate it a bit further? I think we discussed already through the examples and everything, so maybe just in a nutshell to mm -hmm. run through them quickly. Uh, so as we said, uh, the national court decides on the admissibility of the complaint in case both member states have rejected it. It sets up the advisory commission if the competent authorities cannot agree on the composement of the advisory commission. It's there to inform, enforce, to obtain the final decision. So, for example, if the final decision has not been notified and delivered to the taxpayer, the taxpayer can go to the national courts and obtain that final decision. Then later, if that the final decision is not implemented by member states, again, the national court can enforce it. Uh, as we said, there's also a little uh, power they have that they can refuse this implementation in case they deem the advisory commission in the, not sufficiently independent. Um, and of course, when you look at those significant roles, in my view, um, one can question, are they there to unblock the procedure or to provide some kind of check and balance system mm -hmm. to really um, mm -hmm. Take a bit of the power from the hands of competent authorities to tip the scale a bit into the taxpayers' favor. Right. Right. Um, so I see this really as a big improvement. Um, it's a special feature, I would say. It's not seen in the treaty-based uh, map and arbitration. It's really an element of the new directive. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, of course, also, I think, an important aspect for practitioners because um, you need qualified lawyers to do right. so, to right. file the complaint and the final decision mm -hmm. in the relevant member state. So, of course, it uh, entails a lot of practical opportunities and, uh, and yeah, basically work. Right. They're great. You mentioned, actually, a treaty-based map. So let's, let's benchmark, actually, the EU directive against this treaty-based uh, map. Yes, well, I think that we already highlighted, let's say, the aspect of taxpayer rights and the role of domestic courts mm -hmm. in the enforcement. That's something you find in no um, treaty-based map right. arbitration procedures, including the MLI. Um, uh, there, but there are other, let's say, it's minor differences, but um, I think quite peculiar. First of all, I mean, uh, the fact that competent authorities under directive have their own represent representation in the advisory commissions, uh, which many um, uh, critics uh, find, let's say, um, uh, spoiling the independence of the commissions. Authorities themselves, by contrast, are very happy um, with this um, uh, opportunity because they say otherwise it might be very difficult for us to have our voices properly heard by the Commission. Um, but it's strange, nonetheless, mm -hmm. you don't find it in treaty-based arbitrations. Um, another thing which personally I think is very useful um, is that the directive, like the, um, the prior arbitration convention, uses lists of experts. That, that really is uh, help to authorities in finding proper and qualified people. The list as pre, uh, provided for right now under the um, uh, directive are too limited. Mm -hmm. That's another issue, but the very fact that they have a list, that's a good um, uh, mm -hmm. step forward. Um, um, 
a difference also to highlight is the appointing authority for the commissions in cases where the authorities, the competent authorities, fail to appoint members. Um, ordinarily, in treaty-based arbitration, that appointing authority is the OECD. Now, I can imagine that <laughs> EU didn't want to give that honorary position to right. the OECD, right. but at the same time, uh, EU member states didn't want to have the commission <laughs> to have that honorary position. So I think that's why they ended up at domestic courts. Um, the type of arbitration, as mm -hmm. we may call it, under the directive, I think is reasoned opinion. That means that the commissions are allowed to form their own views on the dispute at hand. Now, many um, competent authorities, by contrast, have a preference for what they call baseball arbitration, which is of United States origin, and where the arbitrators only are allowed to choose between one or the either position mm -hmm. presented by the competent authorities. Now, the directive allow the authorities, instead of the advisory commission, to choose for a special ADR commission, which can operate on um, uh, the basis of baseball arbitration. Mm -hmm. But I think priority is being given to reasoned opinion arbitration. Um, the timelines, I think, the fixed timelines on the directive are a great asset. That's something you won't find ordinarily mm. under treaty-based arbitration. There right. the timelines are to be agreed between mm -hmm. the uh, competent authorities and can even be agreed on a case-by-case -case basis. That gives far less security mm -hmm. to the taxpayer. Um, and publication, I think that's all another distinguishing feature. While the directive uh, aims at publication and publication right. in full, right, of the decision mm. and only allows, let's say, for a abbreviated and anonymized version if either of the authorities or the taxpayer explicitly ask for it. Um, Treaty-based arbitration usually aims at non-publication right. of, um, uh, of decisions. And basically, I think to prevent decisions from having a presidential value. And I think in this respect, it's interesting to see that the 2017 update of the OECD model, which is later than the MLI, um, already provides for publication. So that's a deviation from the MLI. And the explanation mm. the OECD has given uh, is that publication doesn't necessarily mean that authorities should be bound by the decision in any future cases. So publication doesn't automatically mean presidential right. value. Right. So I, I, I would consider, I think that the OECD actually has looked into the directive. I thought, well, directive acting in this respect is better than the MLI. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you, Hans, for pointing out this. Uh particular details. All right, let's go on. Uh, what does uh, the director not address? Um, <laughs> unfortunately, there are a few things uh, missing. First of all, I think that's the main thing, that the, the directive does not bother at all um, with how competent authorities conduct the MAP negotiations. Mm -hmm. It simply leaves the MAP process as such untouched. Right. And uh, maybe, perhaps the thinking was, well, I mean, whether they screw up or not, after two or with some prolongation, three years, they will end up in arbitration anyway. Right. So there's a sword above uh, yes. the map. Right. Yes. Um, the OECD, by contrast, does try to cast some influence on the authorities mm. and how they behave in, uh, in MAP. So you see the minimum standards provided under Action 14. There is the BAP's inclusive framework aimed at non-OECD member states, where, and I've been in one, very detailed instructions are being given to mm. authorities 
what a proper map, map, map conduct implies. Right. There is the peer review process going on. Um, uh, many people uh, at first were very skeptical and they never thought that uh, colleague competent authorities would criticize each other. But the truth is a little bit different. Right. Some of right. the reports indeed are very critical. Mm. Um, and then finally, the OCD has also created the MAP Forum, a secretive uh, phenomenon uh, aimed, as the OCD says, to exchange best practices in MAP. That's not something we can verify what's happening there because it's all secretive. Um, uh, <laughs> So transparency is not for the MAP Forum. Um, and there are a few other things, two other things vis-à-vis um, uh, uh, -vis the um, uh, proceedings of the advisory commissions. I think we already addressed that. First of all, is the policing. Um, uh, you would ideally want to see an instrument for policing um, independence requirements before the commission starts. Uh, and another thing, which in practice I think is really a serious issue, is the case administration. Mm. Who will do the case administration? Um, it's left, I think, to the commissions themselves to do that. Mm. And it's not just typing, it's also, mm. let's say, observation uh, of the various procedural um, requirements, right. whether they're properly met. Uh, whether the authorities do what they have to do, whether the uh, independent members do as they're assumed to do, that mm -hmm. is an issue of case administration. And I think ordinarily advisory commissions and people who are appointed in, um, in those commissions are not really trained to do that. Right. And uh, finally, I mean, even the United States and Canada, for their baseball, their limited baseball arbitrations, have case administrations done by an external mm. institution who's really expert in this. And, mm. and uh, that's quite a relief for the arbitral panels. Right. And uh, from time to time also provide good advice on procedural issues as they may arise and right. sometimes do arise. Mm -hmm. Yes, now you want to add uh, something? Yeah, just a small point on the directive. Um, it gives, let's say, a limited um, guidance, um, rules of procedure. So it offers, let's say, like sort of a template to the competent authorities to agree on rules of procedure. In my understanding, the taxpayer doesn't really have any say in that, so this is really a matter between the competent authorities to agree on it, but it tries to um, guide them, at least in a way that it notes the, all the elements that should be uh, considered. Right, right, thank you. All right, uh, we have five minutes left, so very briefly, uh, is MAP arbitration accessible and attractive for taxpayers? Um, well, one thing I think that should be uh, remarked up front, if, if the taxpayer doesn't file a complaint, nothing will happen. He will not mm. have a resolution. So attractive and accessible. Well, sometimes you have to swallow <laughs> through right. various steps. Now, I think so far, one of the main impediments was that there simply was no guidance, no regulations available how to access MAP. Now, uh, thanks to uh, the minimum standards uh, under uh, Action 14, I think that will be removed um, quite mm -hmm. quickly. Right. That will not be uh, much of an issue, particularly not in Europe anymore. Um, there is careful planning required from a taxpayer because um, uh, also the directive forces a taxpayer to choose between various instruments, right. if you have right. obtained uh, a, a domestic court decision, you can no longer uh, obtain a decision in arbitration. So you really need to know what you're going to aim for. Another problem, uh, a serious problem in practice, not occurring very often, but if it occurs very serious, is that local auditors will may not be, let's say, very happy with taxpayers who request either MAP or arbitration and may threaten to impose informal penalties 
by raising assessment for other years than that in dispute. Right. That, of course, is entirely unacceptable if that would ever occur. But, I mean, as a taxpayer, if you face that situation, I mean, you will probably think twice before um, uh, ringing a bell with others. <laughs> um, so that is a problem. I think there is there are common issues known with independence and empowerment of competent authorities that mainly that mainly relates to yes. the map conduct yeah. whether they are really capable of doing a proper work in uh, in map the black box the horse trading practices that we often see not principal position just trading cases off so you think as a taxpayer you may have a good case mm, Unfortunately, your case has been given away in return to another case. That doesn't make taxpayers very happy. But at the end of the day, I mean, there's the arbitration. So probably the policy should simply be sit those two or three years of map out and wait until you can get to arbitration. But let me just remind you, you know, that in some cases, as we presented, it can be eight and a half and 12 and more. So, uh, <laughs> yes. but you are absolutely right. I agree with you uh, completely. All right. So why uh, the competent authorities may prefer either to set in a map or to arbitrate? Yes. What, well, what I mentioned, the number of arbitration we've seen so far is small. Right. And I think from that we can conclude unfortunately that there is still let's say sort of arbitration avoiding attitude mm. among authorities even on, among those authorities that have already committed themselves to arbitration under clauses or and and or under directive right, right so i mean if they don't want to go to arbitration the only option they have under the directive is to settle in time right um right. And, well, the question is, do you actually want to do it? I mean, you, there may some, be some problems. I mean, you don't like the role of the taxpayers in the procedure. You don't like the procedure at all that's being provided for under the directive. Let's say you have the uh, opportunity to, uh, to uh, agree a different procedure via the yeah. ADR right. Commission, if that's your problem. Um, <laughs> You may think that you really don't need arbitration because you can resolve anything through MAP and arbitration will only serve to push an uncooperative other authority, of course it's always the other authority who is uncooperative, into settling. These may be your um, uh, uh, drivers mm. to continue to avoid arbitration, but I think there is also, in particular under the directive, some attractive uh, aspects also for um, authorities to go to arbitration. Mm. First such of as? all, such as quite often there is an imbalance in power between authorities. Right. So I you mean the, the case when, when right. the United States negotiates with right. a smaller uh, yeah, but it's yeah. smaller country. Right. I mean, of course, the bigger country is very unlikely to concede on a position. Mm. Now, I mean, so it's often the smaller country who's pushed into a settlement right. and, and concede on its position. With arbitration, they don't have to do that anymore. They can simply say, well, if I think I have a good position, right. all right, then let's wait, we'll go to arbitration. Mm. Another thing is the capacity and expertise issue, which many authorities face. Yeah. Um, yeah. I don't think arbitration actually is meant like that, but mm. it does give you, let's say, a relief for these kind of issues. Yeah. Remind that very often in MAP, and that's what we see in reports of the um, JTPF in the EU, not even a single position paper right. has been exchanged by local auditors. So a lot of work still has Correct. to be done. And I think that the uh, commissions uh, provided they are meant with proper expertise, mm -hmm. uh, can offer some relief for authorities mm. in this respect. All right, thank you very much, uh, Hans. And then finally, some policy concerns for the EU? Should I start? <laughs> yeah, should you start? Well, finally, because you're going to attack on it. 
Well, I mean, the big question was, I think, already before the adoption of the directive, where does the OECD fit in? Because it was mm -hmm. the OECD that um, released Action 14, and then the EU kind of beat it to its punch and uh, introduced the draft proposal before they introduced MLI. Um, so how do the procedures interplay, as we mentioned before? Neither of the institutions released any opinion on it or right. any position. Um, then, of course, we need the guidance for local courts, uh, for the competence authorities. We could call it maybe capacity building. Right. Um, there are efforts done in that field, so there's a, that's, I think, a positive development. Um, we need, as Hans emphasized, we need a larger and more diverse list of expertise. The experts shouldn't be limited to those um, currently provided in the directive. But I'm an optimist, and I believe that throughout the practice, of course, you see the need, you see the direction, and you can always come back and revisit the directive. Um, so we should not limit ourselves um, to yeah, fearing how this might result, uh, but rather be optimist. Um, of course, there's also a lot of um, ideas, pushes uh, for something more permanent, already from, let's say, 10 years and even more years ago, um, there were ideas of, some, of an international tax court. Of course, there's a whole debate behind it, if that's politically feasible or not. Um, within the EU, we will see the direction we go towards, mm. maybe with uh, through the route of alternative dispute resolution. Right. Um, it also depends, uh, of course, the, on the new commission, on the new elections, where will the push be? How will the substantive tax law develop? Uh, how many disputes will uh, resolve? In my personal opinion, um, I think we should, we will, and we should move to something more, uh, more permanent. Mm. Um, I even think that maybe linked to the previous discussion, MAP at such is even maybe fundamentally flawed. Right. Because right. arbitration, I see it as a good point. Maybe under the current directive is also may be seen as a deterrent effect. So it really right. will try to act more in a way that forces the competent authorities to already resolve the dispute in MAP. However, in my view, yes, I think uh, MAP is fundamentally flawed because you have two parties in the room whose money is not at stake. Right. Quite the contrary, they want right. that money. Mm. So the interest here is not at the right, uh, right spot. But of course, that's uh, long-term thinking. Mm -hmm. um, but at the end of the day, we are still dealing with tax. It's right. money, it's uh, issues of sovereignty, especially in the EU where you need unanimity. Uh, so I think currently we have right. to deal with what we have, which is already a good improvement, but it's a step-by-step -step approach. Yes. I think yes. now it gives more rights to the taxpayer. It's really significantly improved. I think there's still room to improvement mm. uh, to conclude. And if we really uh, shift to something more permanent, this would provide even more certainty right. for the taxpayer. So right. I see a positive trend. Well, I think, uh, I mean, I opened actually the poll uh, question to our viewer. I think it seems 100% of them agree, actually, um, that uh, a broader jurisdiction, including all taxation within the EU, would be the right solution. Yes. So, uh, and there is the, I mean, Right now, I think the, the, the directive calls on authorities to look for the possibility of creating permanent um, arbitration tribunals. Right. Uh, which is not, let's say, the permanent tax court or... Um, uh, but, I mean, these are permanent tribunals. And there are already, let's say, alternatives. I think we've seen um, Germany and Austria agreeing a role for the European Court in this respect. I'm not quite sure whether the European Court wants to take more <laughs> cases on like this, but in any case, there's a precedent. There is also the excellent alternative of mm -hmm. the um, uh, International uh, Permanent Court of Arbitration at the Peace Palace in The Hague, which was especially created mm -hmm. under auspices of the UN to deal with disputes between states. Right. And um, so, and I think having this kind of permanency um, uh, would have two advantages. It would give, let's say, additional professionalization to arbitration, which is absolutely mm -hmm. necessary mm -hmm. if you're going to have more arbitration than right. just occasionally. Right. And secondly, it will also provide for more transparency. I think, and I think this is probably 
one of the main things for the future. Um, if you want to have arbitration um, accepted by the wider public, you should aim for as much as uh, uh, transparency as you po right. possibly can. Before we say goodbye, what's your final? Or what would be the final takeaway for our viewers? So, what if you can summarize your opinion, uh, uh, best advice you can give to the viewers uh, about this topic? What would that be? Well, I mean. You're not going to avoid disputes in all cases. In fact, there will be more, whether you like it or not. So, I mean, having uh, improved dispute resolution instruments available is incredibly welcome and necessary. And I think the directive excels right. um, in this respect in particular by the um, uh, role and the leverages it gives to um, mm. uh, taxpayers. Correct. Correct. Yasna? I agree. I think we see a great shift from full power of the competent authorities and empowering the taxpayer. And of course, giving him the guarantee to reach a solution, to have a mean, and not necessarily in eight years as our worst case scenario uh, envisioned, but really on a short term. Mm -hmm. And of course, as, an, as important the role of the taxpayer is, I think also the role of the petitioner is even more important. Guiding the, right. the taxpayer, being aware of the procedure, and um, also making the directive work in practice. Mm. Mm. All right. Well, thank you very much. It was really brilliant. Uh, as a final conclusion, uh, let me personally really thank you on behalf of viewers, your expertise. I really enjoyed it, and I'm sure actually that the viewers enjoyed the um, well, the insights, the intricacies that you highlighted uh, throughout the webinar. In case you like this webinar and you would like to join us for next time, when we are going to deal with the revision of Chapter 7 of the OECD Transfer Pricing Guidelines. That's the upcoming webinar, so please click on the link um, at the middle, in case you have not obtained the slides yet and you would like to have them, uh, there's the link on the top. And in case you would like to, well, just uh, look around on our website to get to know more of our services or products, uh, please also, there's a call to action button available. Otherwise, please bear with us for, uh, with a, for a minute and uh, until the uh, marketing survey pops up on your screen and uh, give your feedback. Thank you very much and uh, have a nice evening. Goodbye.